You're now listening to the smooth sounds of life after death. I'm your host, D. Marcus Garrett. Let's get started with this week's episode. Three, two, one. And this is the drop today. I'm speaking with Sarah Arnold Hall. And Sarah helps people take action. Welcome to the show. <laughs> if, you're, if you've ever tried debt plans but repeatedly failed to reach life after debt, then click the link in my show notes to purchase a copy of my best-selling book, Debt Free or Die Trying, or visit themarcusgarrett.com slash debt free, and I'll send you a free PDF. This segment is made possible thanks to our partners, partners like Bright Sellers. Learn more about your palate with Bright Sellers, the personalized wine subscription. If you're on YouTube right now, it's probably floating somewhere on your screen through the magic of editing because there's a better way to buy wine. For a limited time, Bright Sellers will give you 50% off your first order when you click the referral link found right now in your video description or show notes. Now back to the show and welcome to the show, Sarah. Awesome. I'm so pumped to be here. And you have your own podcast, which, if I recall correctly, is How to Take Action. Can you tell the people a little bit about your show? Yeah, absolutely. So my podcast is all about exactly what it sounds like, how to take action. It's how to get yourself to do the things that you say you're going to do, because I think that's the foundation for hitting any goal. If you can become the kind of person who always does what you say you're going to do, nothing can really stop you from any goal that you want to hit or achieve in your life. Because once you know how to do the things, you just go ahead and do them. And we arrived here today uh, through the magic of the algorithm internet. I actually don't know how it came to be, but there was a photo floating around. I know you have it on your Twitter profile and Instagram, which uh, if you're on YouTube, you can see right now. If you're in the uh, podcast streets, it'll be in your show notes. But it talked about showing up daily. And it was two pictures of what we think it means and what it actually means. And what we think it means is these full circles. You show up at, you know, 110, OD, woke, whatever the kids are saying these days. But what it actually means is you show up full, you show up half full, you show up empty, but you consistently show up. As your show says, you take action. Um I found out after the fact, you know, so for, for the people wondering, I, I tagged you on Instagram. I think I put a, a fabulous <laughs> track behind it. You know, you got to you got to get the reels, got to get the views up. Uh, and it actually worked. And so we connected. But what, I guess, inspired that photo and what did it mean to you? What does it mean to show up daily? Yeah. OK, well, the original inspiration came to me over two years ago, maybe three years ago now. Um, I found a blog post by a man named Sean Wess, who essentially the blog post said, if whatever goal you want to achieve, you have to show up every day for it for two years. And that is how you're going to achieve it. Until you are willing to show up every day for two years, like one, even one year isn't enough. But the point being that you show up like, whatever energy you've got to give, you give that instead of being like, cause I don't have a hundred percent energy today. I can't do it. It's like, if you've got 1% energy, give that 1% and then go watch Netflix and go to bed or whatever you want to do. But that way you're always constantly moving forward instead of kind of holding ourselves to like this perfect standard. Sometimes I tease my clients and I say, if you don't feel like going to the gym, go and read a book at the gym because that way you're at the gym still and you're still keeping the habit of the habit, which is more important than actually whether or not you pump weights that day. And first of all, that's a great story. You may have answered this. So when that uh, photo came up and I, I found it pretty uh, inspirational, I'm, 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 I almost said photogenic, but that's not it. <laughs> I have a face made for podcasting for those who are not watching on YouTube. Uh, it's oh, uh, visually so oriented. <laughs> I'm visually oriented. There we go is what I actually meant to say. And I, I showed it to my fiance and, uh, Interestingly enough, she was near the, the empty circle point and she's like, how do you get back to full? And mm. I readily actually didn't have an answer. So do you have advice for the person who's in the empty circle right now? How do they get back to full? Mm. Well, the first thing that I would say is don't put any pressure on yourself to get back to full. Like the, as soon as we put the pressure, like that's where the perfectionism comes in. What if it's OK for you to just be at five percent for the next few months. If that's the kind of energy you've got, 
you give your five percent and that's what you do um of course i can you know recommend the classic you know get more sleep drink more water all of the things but page in a book like that's still going to push you closer instead of being like oh well i'm going to need to create more space and more time and more energy in my life I appreciate that. I'm going to attempt uh, to pull up a quote I was reading. Actually, I'm not going to say the book because it's one of those books that has a great message, but probably hasn't aged well for our society in our present day. <laughs> so I had a lot of great takeaways from it, but I'm like hesitant to recommend it. If you was like, oh, huh, he's reading that. So, that being said, it, it did have a, a good sentence in it that related to this. And I'll attempt to pull that up in the next portion of our conversation. But I do like the it's okay to be at 5% energy. Uh, and I, I think that's forgotten a lot of times. I think it's, uh, especially in this um, comparison society, if you will, especially social media, it's it's 100% or nothing. Everyone's always at 100% all the time. Uh, and right. we know that not to be true, but that's the way that it always looks. Well, that's what I think about consistency. I think we've used the word consistency to mean perfection. Like be consistent in like, you know, and how you make your, go to the gym and do it all perfectly or or make all of your posts look absolutely beautiful and have the same font and every like all perfect and instead of what we mean what i think consistency means is to just consistently keep showing up even if you're totally inconsistent in the way that you show up yeah i agree with that i was able to find it uh so people if you and that, now let me once again full disclosure and asterisks. I'm telling you not to read the book, but if you Google this quote, you'll find the book. <laughs> so the quote from the book is, uh, I think this is a line in the chapter and it was racing towards a non-existent finish line. And the quote is most people make the error of thinking that one day it will be done. They think if I can work enough, then one day I could rest or I'm only doing this now so that one day I can do what I really want with my life. But this exercise of waiting for everything to be right, I find is equally futile. Um, so I appreciate you showing, saying that you can show up with 5% and what's more important is consistently show up. I really like your two year example. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. In your real example, actually, it's proving that you've already done in this, I'll transition a little bit. I so I'll call this fact of the day. Um, bam, 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 bam. You know, I'm always making stuff up on this. Well, I don't always make up a lot of stuff. I was actually an auditor in a past life, but <laughs> I have no idea if this quote is accurate or not. I've been citing it anyway because it sounds good. And it's from Jack on Twitter. If you want to go find it, I don't know who Jack is, and I think he cited Reddit. So whatever. But it says ninety percent of podcasts don't get past episode three. That's for context, there's two million episodes or two million podcasts roughly available as of 2022. That's 1.8 million who quit. Of the 200,000 left, 90% will quit after 20 episodes. That's another 180,000 gone. Thus, mm. to be in the top 1% of podcasts in the world, you only need to publish 21 episodes. And I thank you, Sarah, on episode 23. <laughs> so. That's amazing. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I think I'm literally, yeah, I've just surpassed that myself. So I, that's wild. I'm yeah, so excited to be there. You're in the <laughs> I top one percent. So you have a podcast, how to take action. And you have taken more action than what do you say? 1.8 million people? Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> so, this is the hottest thing, right? Like I would say the same thing about blogging. I I had a blog since 20 17 and in 2017 I think I published like four posts or something like that my best friend had to actually come over and like be like stop trying to change the font like you're done with the font just press the button she she published my first one for me and it was it wasn't until I committed to just doing something daily and showing up daily with it that I actually started making lots of um, it, and not episodes, lots of blog posts because being like, I'm just going to keep doing this every week, regardless of how I feel about it. Like, I'm not going to let my feelings of how, whether or not I feel like doing it get in the way. I'm just going to do it because that's what I said. That's, I think, the, the key for me, at least. Well, I feel like it's such a relevant conversation now 
related to exactly what you said with with COVID and the pandemic uh, by extension or uh, in relation. I was watching. First of all, I'm off Twitter now. I, I'm I put in my air fingers. I'm off Twitter. I still have an account. I like <laughs> log in and lurk, but I, I haven't tweeted since like August. It, it was just too overwhelming, which is what I'm building up to. But it's like it's. Even for me, uh, and I, I say that because I've produced a lot of crap over the years for the folks that have been following since I think I've been out there since uh, since MySpace glitter graphic days. So whatever whatever that was, I was out there and I was blogging at that time. <laughs> but it, the level of exhaustion I feel during the pandemic uh, is it, it, I, I can't even put words to it. Like I'm even struggling now. Like I, I'll wake up, my eyes open. I'm already done. Like my eyes open. I'm like, I'm done with this day. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like how to take action and find motivation and consistency in this unique, uh, hopefully historical period of time is more critical of a conversation than ever. It, it, is that a thought you share? Has this that perhaps even literally in your case, catching COVID shaped your, your mindset about consistency? But um, what about this environment now and the impact on taking action? Yeah, that's so interesting. My business actually took off during COVID. Um, not when I had COVID, but during during when the pandemic started. Um, I definitely think it shaped for me the when, especially when I got sick, the experience of realizing that I was gonna have to do the bare minimum. And sometimes how the bare minimum, I call it minimum viable action. So it's like as if you had a minimum viable product that you were putting out, but this is your minimum viable action you're taking. Sometimes that's more valuable than just trying to do everything and make everything perfect. And transitioning a little bit in the life after death segment and a segment of the segment, a sub segment, if you will, is the game changer. You have an episode, episode 19. Uh, for those of you listening right now on the podcast, you can find it at the how to take action. And it is big money goals. I'm not going to do I'm just hey hashtag no spoilers right now. I'm hoping that you'll hit it, but I have it here in the notes. But before that, we talked about overcoming debt with a partner. Can you talk a little bit about that story? Mm, yeah. So when I started my business, I I thought I, I was a little bit um undereducated around how I was going to make sales. And I thought I would just like get certified as a coach and like people would just like bulldoze me over, like with clients would just all want to come and work with me. And that wasn't the case straight away. Even though I had a large audience, actually, I must've had like 17,000 followers, but I hadn't learned how to market myself yet. And so I ended up getting myself into about $5,000 of debt with my partner. So I didn't have the debt with a credit card company. So I was lucky that way. I didn't have to pay interest, but still at the time, like $5,000, I was making like $800 a month. I was living on $800 a month. I mean, in fact, I was living on more than that, which is how I got into the debt with my partner because he was like funding me to live and pay my groceries and my rent. Um, but it wasn't, I was like, how am I ever gonna get out of this? It just didn't seem possible. I knew in the long term I would, like I had this hope, I knew that I wouldn't stay in it forever, but it was just really, like I felt really, really stuck. And I actually had to quit. I quit my job to start my business and then I had to get a job again. So that was like a really painful uh, part of my journey was realizing actually, you know, I failed in the way that I, I mean, you different definitions of failure, but I didn't do what I set out to do straight away. And I had to go, but I worked really, I worked really, really hard during that time. And I, all I would listen to was like Dave Ramsey podcasts the whole time, like get, get me to work, like, come on, hustle, do it. And I actually had the thought in my head, I was telling someone this the other day that I didn't see, because I was so miserable in this job, I really, really didn't want to be doing it. All I did was answer phone calls about cats all day, just like lost cats. It was lost cat after lost cat after lost cat. It was so boring. But I had to constantly answer these phone calls. And so instead of seeing it like I was in this job that I was never going to get out of and I was never going to make my business successful and I was going to be in all this debt, I decided to see it as if I had gone to my boss and he had said, okay, listen, you can, if you come and work for me, I will pay your bills. I will pay for you to your food and I'm going to invest money into paying off your debt and, and into your business as well. If you come and work with me for a certain amount of time, like six months or a year or however long I had calculated I was going to need to like get out of the debt, then 
like I will give you that money. And so instead of seeing it like I was just going to work each day to be paid for this, I was seeing it like an exchange from my boss. Like he was investing into my business and into my future, which was such a helpful way for me to, to imagine getting out of the debt instead of feeling like I was just getting paid seven pounds an hour. You talk about both what you learned good and bad about so what society taught you money meant. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to get it exactly to what I said in the podcast. Um, is there, was there something specific about it that you liked? You were talking about, uh, in this specific example, your mother, I believe in it. I mean, it's your story. I might get it wrong. So my memory telephone game of your story was that your mother uh, had loaned you some money, but you had were supposed to get some of that money back from your friends. And you were embarrassed to ask them. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're like, you had this this emotional embarrassment around money. Uh, even I think you were at a young age at the time and you were like, I didn't learn this in the home. And I thought that was a really fascinating quote because I think a lot of people assume that everything that you learn about money is from the home. And in this case, you were like, no, society taught me to be embarrassed about asking my friends for money and needing to even, even though they owed you the money, <laughs> you were embarrassed to ask for the money back. There's somebody at home right now relating to this right now. Cause I'm positive somebody owes them money. Cause somebody probably owes me money right now. If I thought hard enough about it, uh, did that refresh you enough? Yes, or, totally. Or? Yes. And I think what you're saying is really important because I think it's very easy for us to blame our parents for everything. And I want to um, confirm to my mom, if she's listening, like it was not her and it was certainly not any specific person's fault that I had these, you know, money um, stories that I couldn't ask for money, but it just felt like in the society that I grew up in, nobody talked about money. You either had it and you didn't talk about it because you don't want to make other people feel bad about it. The fact that you had it or you didn't have it and you didn't talk about it because you don't want people to know that you didn't have it. So I remember even we had this television we'd been given um, and it was like, it had a crack down it because we, it was like a secondhand one, but it was, we, we, it was a beautiful big flat screen TV we've been given it, but it was like a little bit broken. And like growing up money for me was just constantly a game of trying to make everyone else feel like it was okay. Even, and I'm, you're, you're absolutely right. Like the story that you're talking about was when I went to the movies um, with my, my friends, I had five of my friends, my mom took us, but because we'd asked to go to the movies, my mom said we, we were in a rush and she said she would quickly pay um, so that we could quickly get into movies, but everyone would need to pay me back. But of course, at 13 years old, you're like busy. You're not even thinking about who paid or, or maybe they were, but didn't want to offer in case, unless I asked. And so nobody except one friend, she did, she was sweet. She paid me back, but everybody else didn't. And so I got all the money from my piggy bank, smashed it open and gave it all to my mom and pretended that it was from my friends because I was too afraid to ask them, even though, like that was money they owed me. I remembered it was prom 2001. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and these people who still follow me on Facebook owe me money because I was the only one that had a credit card. There you <laughs> go. I, 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 yeah, I got a block of rooms and they're like, oh, we're going to pay you, pay you back. I ain't never seen that money. I mean, if I add interest on it now, it's probably like $2 million. It's probably like a Texas lotto worth of money that these people owe me. So. I mean, we still Facebook friends. Feel free to still send it to me. But they were definitely silent about it. And I, I wasn't embarrassed. It was more like, do I charge my friends up, you know, on the last day of school about this money? Uh, now that I'm on the wrong side of 30, I'm feeling some type of way about it. So that being said, uh, do you want to share uh, what your big money goal is? Yeah, sure. This is something that I had, you know, like aunts, uncles, grandparents, people like that. I would feel a little bit uncomfortable to declare this. Um, in front of them, but I'm actually working on that. And so my goal is to make a million dollars in a year. And I, I want to sit here and just leave that. It's so hard not to put a disclaimer about why I want to do that or why I think that's okay. And I'm, here's my work. I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to let it be. I'm going to make a million dollars in a year one day. Oh, that, actually not one day. It's going to be by the year 2025.